20 and 30 years ago, us old girls, were out there talking about this, but we didn't call it trauma-informed. We are like, what in the world are we going to do to help these kids? Like, what is going on? And then out of the States comes the term trauma-informed. But I think language is everything. So I kind of wish they didn't call it trauma-informed and that they would name it as adverse childhood events informed or adverse life events. So ACE is informed or ALS informed, which would better reflect. Because as soon as you put trauma in a title, people make assumptions, right? And all the educators in this room, you knew when you were in the classroom and those little, little guys are showing up, you knew your more mm, typical ACEs kids, right? But it could be any kid. It could be any child. So a lot of like, the strategies that we've been working to compile are to deliver at a classroom level because you don't always know. But here's the issue. All this time, we've been seeing certain behaviors in the classroom, and they get labeled attention deficit, right? <clears throat> they get labeled failure to thrive. They get labeled oppositional defiant conduct disorder, right? Sometimes we go as far in mental health to call them bipolar. When it's just little people out of adverse events that are trying to be okay, but they use extreme coping, right? Because they didn't have sometimes an uninjured caregiver who could help them out with that wonderful term, self-regulation. Don't you love it? Like Dawson Creek, we had fun when we went to Dawson Creek. We played with IEP language, right? And what do you see on IEP sometimes? Sarah will learn to self-regulate. <laughs> really? <laughs> right? Can you give me a little time frame for that? Right? Because it's kind of written up as like, by December. <laughs> by December, Sarah's going to learn to self-regulate. Oh, really? And how are you all doing with self-regulation? Do you know what stresses you out all the time? Do you have strategies besides that glass of wine at night to deal with what stresses you out at night? Maybe not, right? Because look at us. Like, our ability to self-regulate varies on any given day. Was your significant other emotionally available to you this morning? <laughs> Did your children comply? Right? And then you walk in the classroom, and you're off, and the kids are off. Because they pick it up better than anybody. But look at how we do this crazy thing, and we're like, oh, we've got some siblings we worked with in the past. And one of them... She complied with everything you asked. Pretty tense little kid, but she was a perfectionist. And she did everything. Her brother told you to go soak your head and threw objects around the classroom, right? They're both coping. Because look at us in this room. Chances are the majority of people in this room, not to make eye contact at this point, <laughs> but <clears throat> chances are you might be, have perfectionist tendencies and you might be a bit of a workaholic. <laughs> Just wondering. So you're coping in a different way. And let's say you had a sibling who didn't become a workaholic and did not have perfectionist tendencies. So he's using substances. So society loves you but not so much your brother, right? He's seen in a different light. And those are our kids in the classroom. So this idea of, wow, this is hidden. A lot of what shows up with these kids is hidden until they hit school, because you're a safe environment and you're safe people. So where do little kids out of trauma fight back? Safe environments, safe people. They can't do it in their home environment, chances are. So they walk into that school and it's like, hey, little buddy, we need you to do this. It's like, 
No. I'm like, good on you, little buddy. Fighting back against oppression and abuse. <laughs> I love saying that, too, because kids will look at you like, what? <laughs> no, that is an amazing coping strategy you got there. Now, I'm thinking it might be a little hard on some of these teachers. So I'm wondering if we could work on that together. But that's what they're trying to do. And so it's such an honor to me when people yell at me. It's like my clients yell at me. I'm like, good job, Linda. Right? They feel safe and supported. Good job. I've tried to tell that to teachers. They're like, that is a difficult reframe, Linda. <laughs> that is really a tough reframe. I know, counselors are terrible. We'll reframe anything. So that idea that most people go to, oh, we must be talking about kids out of abuse, emotional, sexual, physical abuse, and neglect, right? Everybody in this room knows neglect will present at the highest end because nobody did anything. And you almost don't have a core identity to work with, right? They kind of develop it in front of your eyes if you're that supportive person. But the idea of severe attachment disruption, death of a caregiver, like horrendous divorce, kids are presenting as if. And the other one that's coming out is look at little ones who had extensive medical procedure as babies. It saved their life, but the body doesn't know it wasn't trauma because it was trauma. So they're presenting. And it's so interesting at the university level to find kids who are working with access services, disability management, and that is the issue. So how do you define it, right? And that's been the hardest thing in terms of research. How do you define trauma? Because it's so broad. So it's not going to be the specific event. How does this kid respond when you ask him to do something new? How does he respond when there's stress or something changes within the classroom, right? And then you're going to see it come out. And it's going to come out in extreme ways or somewhere in between. So either hyper arouse, you know, your favorite little guys who love to tear that classroom down and call you interesting names, right? Or the ones that get missed are our kids who end up dissociating. They shut down. They're the quietest little people out there. They don't really learn anything new in a year. They kind of hold space. And they get lost in all the shuffle. So the best description I've found is trauma is defined by the central nervous system. What happens when kids are asked to do something new when there's a change, when you add stress. And that's probably how you're going to see it, right? That's where it's going to come from. And look at the imprint of adverse childhood events. It can show up in the inability to name emotion. How are you supposed to regulate yourself when you can't even name what you're feeling? Do you love some of your high-end ACEs kids? It's like, how are you feeling today? Mad. How are you feeling tomorrow? Mad. How are you feeling when you sleep? Mad, right? That's it. That's what they got. And the idea of any, like how they feel in that classroom, they might not have explicit narrative of what happened to them, especially zero to three, but they feel it at a body-based level. So a little stress in the classroom, greatest threat to all ACEs kids, teach your own call. Bring in a sub, right? And all of a sudden, what do they present as? My tummy hurts, right? I got to go home. I got to go somewhere. My tummy hurts. My legs hurt. My knees hurt. Because it's going to be a physical sensation. It's internal distress. And people in this room, oh, yeah, invite me back another time. We'll talk about your level of secondary trauma. This is talk about how wrecked you get teaching. I'm just saying. It could happen. But the medical research is now lined up with all this that says stress is really harmful to you. 
If you were an ACEs kid, we want you to look after yourself. Because what happens, high levels, stress hormone, suppressed immune system. Like, so we always check our years out. How are you doing with flu and colds this year? I'm not doing good at the moment. Just saying, I have two little grandkids. I love them dearly, but I don't need them to share everything. <laughs> but the idea of, and what happens when cortisol levels from, if you're an ACEs kid, when they drop, and it's hard to pick up, when they drop, then the body turns on itself autoimmune. Chronic pain, chronic fatigue, MS, diabetes. The research is always is going in that direction now. After all these years, and they weren't listening to us 30 years ago either. Look at your kids. Anything can send them off. Any, like uh, someone coming in the room, a smell, a sound, right? Taste. Anything can be a trigger for these kids. And we can't know all the triggers. You can't know. And look at how they sit. People that work in secondary, look at your, your big kids, right? They sit sometimes super tense, right? They're ready to go at the drop of a hat. Or they go into that hoodie, they go into the hat, <clears throat> and that's where they stay safe. But it's in the muscle. And an overdeveloped sympathetic nervous system and not a well-developed parasympathetic, they actually can't calm down. Not at this point. So you know, we do that crazy thing. It's like, I just need you to calm down, young man. <laughs> oh yeah, what if I could? And what's the other thing we always say? What were you thinking when you hit that other kid? <laughs> if I had access to a prefrontal cortex, I wouldn't have hit that other kid. I'm actually teaching kids to say that. I know, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> <clears throat> they go see admin, it's like, I didn't have access to a prefrontal cortex. Just so you know, right? And after a while, fight, flight, freeze, it becomes a habit, right? It's habitual. Every time they're stressed, watch some of your big kids, and they'll, and they'll tense, right? Because they're ready to go. Because that's how they stay OK out in their world. And the idea of complex trauma, oh my goodness. It took them forever to get here. Because first they were naming, and, and chances are some of you have worked with kids who now would have a formal diagnosis of PTSD. Actually, we're seeing more teachers diagnosed with PTSD. Just saying, right? Better support for teachers. OK, I'll get back on track. Yeah, I'm a good lobbyist, too. Um, <clears throat> So that idea of where are you seeing it? A lot of your kids either can't make attunement, they're not going to connect to anybody in that system, or sometimes they hold on for dear life. Right? They glom on because they know they need to connect. And then you've got affect regulation. Oh, for Pete's sakes. When you come out of ACEs, sometimes, more often than not, you can't regulate your emotion, mainly because you can't name it. You don't know what it is. You can't get it down. If you can't regulate your emotion, how are you supposed to regulate your behavior? They kind of go hand in hand, just a little bit. And nobody was talking about the level of dissociation for a lot of our kids. Because like, do people like you can dissociate emotionally, you can dissociate physically, you can dissociate cognitively. So where do you all dissociate more often than not? Cognitively. Staff meetings. <laughs> I know. I know. And sometimes presentations like this. This is why I make you laugh. I try to keep you out of dissociation. <clears throat> but you check out. Right? Because if you're in a staff meeting and an amazing little colleague is sharing something fascinating, but you're not really in the room, right? That you're thinking about, did I lock the back door? Did I take something out of the freezer for dinner tonight? You go away. So do your kids. They check out on a regular basis 
So our dissociative kids don't learn any better than the hyper arouse, right? They can't take it in. And cognition, oh, for Pete's sakes. Years ago, nobody was linking. Wow, if you come out of adverse childhood events, it might be hard for you to learn new material. Yeah, because you're running on a limbic brain or a reptilian brain stem. No access to that beautiful prefrontal cortex, developing prefrontal cortex. So the idea of thinking for ACEs kids is a luxury. Because if you've been in a survival brain to the ability to think, you just haven't had an opportunity to get there. And that's why safety is everything, right? And the biology we talked about in terms of how it affects them, right, medically, chances are a lot of your kids have a suppressed immune system and you can see it. And how do they see themselves? Not usually very well. Right? I'm pretty sure that I'm to blame for everything that happened to me. I'm pretty sure I don't learn things easily. I must be stupid. And that's what they say to themselves. And now with our amazing, I know it's so hard, we're going to go there, amazing policy of inclusion, a lot of our ACEs kids are put in classrooms and the thing that they know out of that, I can't do this yet. Like, I need time. I need a different environment. I need some quiet. I need a little bit of one-on-one -on -one to get up to speed here, to be able to think. So my biggest call, right, is get a school counselor in every single school, elementary, secondary, that does school counseling to save teachers and to save these kids. Right, because teachers can't do all this. It's big, but we're trying to work on what they can do. So then they said, okay, we got complex trauma. It's different than PTSD. Let's get it in as an official diagnosis, and let's call it developmental trauma disorder. Woohoo! right, DTD. Sounds like a pesticide, but <clears throat> I know. we're working on it. But it was controversial because if you get this in as an official diagnosis, where are the resources to support kids who come into the school system with that diagnosis? So all our systems at this point in time are dramatically under human resourced. Because what works for these kids are going to be human resources, right? more TAs, more ABED, more child and youth care workers so that teachers have better support. And these kids will get there. We'll get them there. They're just down here right now. They're a little delayed right now, but give them a chance. Give them the support. So the controversy is if we get developmental trauma disorder on the books, where's the money to back it up? And then also, you're going to have to change all the other personality disorders. Because what do you call your big kids fighting for power and control? Conduct disorder. Oppositional defiant. Right? Because what does trauma take away? Two main things. Right? Control. Because things that were done to them are totally outside their control. And fun. Right? Play for kids. A lot of our ACEs kids have never played. They've survived, but they haven't played. So look at what the school environment can give them. And we got to work on this, people, in terms of, like, we'll send everybody. I don't know if I, did I send it to Meredith? We, we ended up with a working document for schools to customize for yourselves in terms of what your school, if, the staff decided to go that way, what it would look like to be a fully trauma-informed school. And I'm like little tiny step one. Understanding the effects of trauma on education, step one. There's nine other headings. I know. Who knew? I know, because like we were talking, people are like, yeah, I went to Linda's workshop. We got it. 
no, you don't. You just kind of hung out and laughed for like a couple hours, right? It's way bigger. And the area that's the most tricky for us out of ACE's kids is the discipline policy. And that is heading number like four. Because I have two things on my fridge. And my biggest one is you cannot consequence out a triggered response. When that brain like <laughs> goes to that place where this kid is suddenly afraid and they're triggered, so you're going to see high end, they're going to start throwing things, they're going to call you, whatever, or they're going to shut down. That is a triggered response because chances are they were in line going outside and the little kid bumped the other little kid and he swung and he hit him. And that's where we do that thing. What were you thinking when you hit him? There was no thinking. That's a triggered response. So when you ask them to reflect on what they just did, they'll be like, I don't even know. So in our discipline policy right now at elementary, what do you take away from them when they get in trouble? Recess, lunchtime, art time, field trips, because you're under human resource to be able to support them. And what are those kids, sometimes we forget to look at the UN Charter on the Rights of Children. They have a right to fun, to play, to be a kid. So we don't have answers for school discipline. Every school is trying to figure this out. So was there intent or was there not? Because a lot of our ACEs kids, they can figure out ways to you know, get in big trouble when they have access, but other times it's triggered like that, right? So it's tricky. But look at the, I don't like stats, I'm a qualitative researcher, as Jody and Meredith know. But look, I bring up a little few stats, one's no while for people, right? But three times the rate go up, like go up. And our alternate high schools are full to the brim with ACEs kids, right? Last stop for them. So the areas of concern, oh my gosh, if you can't regulate emotion, we are in big trouble probably for the rest of your life. If that's one thing that schools can do, you'll save kids' lives. Um, that idea of, like, what are you most concerned about is the ability to regulate. And where I was recently in Creston, an amazing teacher said, are you saying, Linda, we should focus on social emotional learning over math? I know. And I took a big leap and I said, yeah. Because as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, people in here that teach math, as far as I know, math might not save your life. But social emotional will. Right? And I know it's bigger than that in curriculum, but the social emotional part is absolutely critical. And learning in cognition. If kids don't feel safe, they can't learn. Right? Because as an academic, you know, like one of the things we're supposed to do, do research, accidental academic, do research and write really boring research articles. Some of you have read those, right? But I make super catchy titles to suck you into reading my really boring research articles. So my favorite one for kids is like, I thought, the kids up north, two main things. Do you like me and am I safe here? Right? And recently we had to adjust that because some teachers said, I don't like these kids. I'm just being honest. I said, well, can you accept them? So either do you like me and am I safe here or do you accept me and am I safe here, right? It's hugely important for them. And relationships, anybody ever notice that your ACEs kids kind of don't do well in social relationships? I know, because if you don't know how to regulate here, how are you supposed to do this thing? Like with another kid, like really hard, right? 
And a teacher recently said, Linda, are there just more little psychopaths being born these days? No. But there's a lot of kids who have no empathy here for themselves, so how can they hold it for others? They, not yet, because they don't know it yet. But there's always hope. So are you OK so far? Everybody like kind of present? You haven't checked out? I can't really see you in the back. There's a reason why people sit in the back of a room, you know, right? They feel safe there, and they know they can dissociate at their, at their pleasure. So self-regulation, did you ever notice a lot more anger and aggression? Woo-hoo, right? Because that's how they survive. That's what works in their environment quite often. Like in there, right there, all the time. And impulse control, oh, for Pete's sakes. You have to have access to the left, to have executive functioning, and to have impulse control. If your little corpus callosum, which may be profoundly affected by the release of stress hormones on top of prenatal exposure to alcohol, if it is very, very thin, and sometimes with kids with FAST non-existent, how are you going to shift from the right to the left? You can't do it until you feel safe. And for kids with FASD, which Meredith and Jody, I'm sure, will talk about, it's not there, right? So you've got to come at it a different way. And non-compliance, I'm taking back control any way I can with safe people. So I'm going to say no to you, because you're not going to hit me. And don't we do this crazy thing, how long has it been since teachers couldn't hit kids? Not that long, right? Where you couldn't get the strap in Canada. 70s. 70s. So then we wonder, 80s. We have first-hand experience, right? <laughs> 80s. <clears throat> right, the 80s. So imagine why parents have a hard time coming into schools. Whoa. If you have an ACEs kid, chances are they have ACEs parents. And if a certain generation, when they went to school, you could hit them, imagine what that does on top of an ACEs environment. Whoa, they don't come well to parent-teacher interviews, right? They're either way up here and they're ready to take you on, or they are checked out. Isn't it amazing when you put it all together? It's incredible. So low persistence because they already have internalized, I'm not very good at this stuff, right? I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to stick with it because I don't think I can do this. So for educators, then it becomes, you've got to find something 99.9% .9 sure they can do. And then you build on that because they're pretty good at identifying this is what I'm not good at. Right? And it's a lot. And difficulty with emotional intimacy, oh yeah, that hasn't gone well sometimes. And then we always go to, how are you doing with emotional intimacy? But that gets a little personal, so I'll move along. <laughs> right? And cognition, right? All these pieces suggest like having trouble with executive functioning because they can't shift to the left yet but they need safety, and they need relationship, and they need time to get there. And this is a crazy thing, because what's the number one misdiagnosis out of like complex trauma? Attention, attention deficit, right? ADHD. And good physicians now who are trauma-informed, and yes, there are some. We're working with them. They're so cute. They always come to me first time we do training, and they're like, what do you want me to do within 10 minutes? Oh, I know, everything you can. And I'm going to tell you what to say in 10 minutes, right? And good physicians, this is what we learned from a really awesome physician. This is what we train them to say. I am so sorry. Those things happened to you as a child. Those things should have never happened to any child. So how can I, in the next nine minutes, help lower pain and distress for you? 
my, how can I be of service to you? And that's what you can say in 10 minutes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I got to, yeah, we're all over those guys. <laughs> but a good trauma-informed physician will say, it's not clinical ADHD, it's stress-based or trauma-based ADHD. And the same thing with a lot of your kids with depression anxiety, right? Not so much the clinical definition, but stress-based or trauma-based depression, right? Anxiety and ADHD. Because these little guys are hypervigilant. And they stay hypervigilant. That's why some people in here sit where you sit, because you kind of need to know that no one's behind you. And what do we do with our kids in our classroom when they act out? Because your aces boys quite often will be at the back of the class. You bring them up front. And then they're, woo, right? Because now someone can go behind me. Because they're always on. Who came in the room? What was that sound? What was that noise? Like, who did what? Because that's how you stay safe. So it's amazing, isn't it? So thinking is a huge part of this. And oh my goodness. To be in a relationship with other kids first when you never really had a relationship with you is super hard, right? And don't you love people that work in high schools? Don't you love your ACEs kids? Because they always find another ACEs kid. <laughs> they always find each other. And as they get older, the drama in high school is extreme, right? You get an ACEs kid who's hyper aroused, who connects with a dissociative ACEs kid. And then we got fireworks, right? Aw. Like if we could just work on relationships, that would shift things a lot. So is this kind of what you see with a lot of your kids, folks, staff? I say staff because it affects all of us, right? All of us. So what's happening now, you won't have an official DSM-5 diagnosis for adverse life events or adverse childhood events. Maybe if you're lucky, the kid comes in and people say, well, he's kind of got PTSD, but it's not really showing up as PTSD because it's way more complex. But the idea of ADHD, conduct disorder, phobic anxiety, because what's anxiety? It's fear, right? And a lot of the new research on PTSD with 100,000 participants in the Millennium Cohort they're describing it as 30% have complex PTSD, the majority have stress-based depression, which is an anxiety, which is fear. So that's what they're calling it, right? And at the highest end, like bipolar, because they're, they swing, right? They'll swing, and it might look like that, but they won't go into psychosis. In general, they won't go at the highest end and tip into first break, right? So that idea, and we put all this behavioral control on kids who are running on a limbic, our reptilian brain. So it's like, young man, this is what's going to happen to you because what you just did makes no sense to him. And kids, your kids with FASD and complex trauma because the overlap between FASD and complex trauma, they sit like that. Because chances are it might have been a high-end environment. There might have been addictions in that environment, right? So you've got a double whammy, on, and they're both affected in similar ways, which I think you're going to talk about. It's going to be the coolest thing. But I hope you talk about something fun in there as well, because you could put people <clears throat> way down here. So you cannot consequence out a triggered response. And don't you love that with behavioral modification? We do this crazy thing. If you're good, I'm going to give you stickers. <laughs> right? Ace's kids are like, I'll tell you what to do with your stickers. <laughs> right? Because I don't even like you. Right? I don't like any of you. So you can't reward me, and your consequences make absolutely no sense. None. 
and FASD, it goes to a whole nother level. So we're trying to find areas like to give educators the training. And one of the biggest calls is get this in curriculum. And I'm so excited because we have a B.Ed. program at the University of Northern BC. And finally, after five years of kind of offering workshops for their new teachers on the weekend, I do it for them on Saturday and Sunday and they come. Now they're going to have a course for it. Oh my goodness. So that they're better prepared. Because people in this room, like when you came out of your teaching program, were you ready? <laughs> I know. Isn't it incredible? And nobody's ever ready. And this idea of if you have ACEs kids, chances are they have ACEs parents. So injured caregivers. And sometimes it's not these acts of commission, it's acts of omission because their parents are dealing with stress-based depression and anxiety. And they're parenting just over here. So the kids feel it, right? And it's just different. And it's the idea of what they need. And intergenerational trauma affects all families from all cultures. And in BC, in Canada, it's so important to address our Aboriginal kids. But this is everywhere. And Aboriginal nations have been on this longer than other groups to lobby hard for better understanding. And you know, like I'm a little bit of a scrapper. I don't know if that became clear pretty fast, right? But there's one phrase that'll get me really fighting is like, the classic line, why can't they just get over it? Really, how about I punch you in the nose and then I'll tell you why they can't get over it. I need to regulate better. <clears throat> but you know how it is when you're a little passionate. And the idea that they understand now, the developmental aspect, first 10 years are kind of critical, right? It's kind of really important to figure out what's going on and PTSD isn't cutting it. What about the epigenetic research? Why can't they just get over it? What are you carrying on your DNA strand? Oh, do you ever ask yourself that when you wake up in the morning? I wonder what kind of residue I have on my DNA strand. I just like to check that out just a little bit, right? But the idea, so the, the idea of the function of genes changes. And they know this <clears throat> from literature out of the Holocaust. And now working on historical trauma with Aboriginal nations. So imagine that. So not to make people depressed or anything, but you're carrying your grandfather's stress. <laughs> Just saying. I mean, there's a little bit of that going on. And the idea of genetic risk, like it's like environmental risk, toxins in the environment, the level of stress in families' environment. And at a systems level, oh my gosh, because we go there with trauma-informed communities because education cannot do this by themselves. That's the idea of the number of families in Canada who are living in poverty. It's unbelievable, right? And it was cute. I had a student in one of my classes, in, and I don't know, he's a little bit of an innocent. And he was like, I'm so proud of how Canada treats all its people. And all of us were like, really? <laughs> I think I'd like to take you to White Horse Yukon in 1976, and I'm going to take you to reserve. And then you tell me what you think. So that idea of chronic interpersonal traumatic stress. And I love this piece, because this helps most of us. Do you know the work of Alan Shore? People know his work? He's a dense writer, right? He's a little bit dense. And we always say, if you have insomnia, buy Alan Shore. Because <laughs> you will put the little book by your bed, and you will read four pages gone every night, right? But he said, we got all fancy on something we shouldn't have got fancy on. This is an archaic brain system, 
an archaic brain response. And like cognitive, like we did this thing around behavioral stuff. If you are good, we'll reward you. And if you are not, here's the consequences. Then we got fans here and said, <clears throat> we just need to change the way you think and you'll feel different and then you'll act different. And that doesn't touch any of this. This is fight, flight, freeze. This is a fearful human being, whether you're a child, youth, or adult. This is about fear response and chronic fear response. So it's archaic. It's an ancient emotion. And what's your most ancient emotion? <coughs> fear, right? Run from those big dinosaurs or whatever your belief system is, right? Get out of there or go fight them. Or if last resort, freeze, might hide. And we understand that works if it just happens now and then, if dinosaurs just show up now and then. If the threat is every single day and when you're a baby, like what are babies supposed to do? You can't fight and you can't run till you freeze. And the other thing on my fridge that I have is darn that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. <laughs> is that how you wake up too, right? Every day I wake up and go darn that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis because there's your fear response, right? That hit, when you're a little bit scared, where do you feel it? Some people feel it in their chest, your heart. Some people feel it in their stomach, little cortisol hit. Imagine being a baby and you get hit over and over and over. And you can't run and you can't fight. So chances are neural pathways might have developed just a little bit differently. So levels of cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and every time you're a little bit scared, it's like that. Hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. For teachers, just write that in your little book every day. That's all it is. <clears throat> I know it feels personal because they're calling you by your first name, right? But there it is. Little system just activated. They're on. They're ready to go. And it's fast. But what happens after a while, if they're running up this end, hyper, they can't shut it off, right? They can't get down. And the kids that they're most researching and confused about are the kids where that feedback loop stops working. Cortisol drops. And then they're not getting the loop. And those kids at a high school level, they're probably going to be called little risk takers, right? Do they think that they're absolutely, like, do they think they can't be hurt? No. The amygdala died, right? And so they're not getting the feedback. So maybe they become our adrenaline junkies as they get older, right? Because they don't have the same fear. And the brain just adapts to its environment. So if you're in a pretty stressful environment, chances are you have an overdevelopment sympathetic nervous system. Get ready. Stuff is coming at you, right? And be, having the ability to calm down probably isn't going to work in certain environments. If you go into a calm state, you might get hurt. So the brain is going to develop along that way. And that idea, I think I went one too fast. So just to be honest, people, right? They actually think it's a five-part brain, but I call it, we've always worked with a three-part brain. And so they think the limbic system is two separate parts now, and epigenetic will be a fifth. But I don't care. It messes with my presentation. <laughs> so there you go. The three-part brain. When you have access to your beautiful cognitive part of your brain that makes humans so proud to be humans, hasn't served us really well sometimes, 
right? But it makes you different than squirrels. You know who's going to be left on Earth when Earth ends? Squirrels. And they don't have a very big, right? There you go. I'm just saying. The idea of you have access to a neocortex, you can do this beautiful thing. Wow. I'm in Mrs. Smith's classroom, and this new person walked in, must be teacher on call. But I think I'm going to be OK, because I still know I'm in Mrs. Smith's classroom, and Joel and Sam are sitting next to me like always. I think I'll be OK. If you start running on a limbic brain, the amygdala is fired up. They're like, whoa, new person. Like, new person, stranger. Right? The alarm is like, I feel like I'm feeling fear at this point. This is going to be unpredictable. This is new. And when they're terrified, they're running off a reptilian brainstem. And you cannot talk to a reptilian brainstem. To your central nervous system, try talking to it. And when you're really upset, you probably have felt this once or while, once in a time in your life. When you're super upset, like really up here, and your significant other tries to talk to you, honey, I just need you to calm down. Those are fighting words, right? Are they effective? And what do we do with kids? He's up here, he's running, right? He's starting to go, reptilian brain response. And we say, Jim, you just need to use your strategies. His strategies are in his neocortex, and he can't get there. So what are you going to do? Right? He's got to have a felt sense of being OK. So you're going to find the person that he attunes to and get them fast. And it's going to be a blanket. It's going to be food. It's going to be anything that brings him down a notch. But he can't hear you. Like, he can't hear you. And what is Peter Levine? He talks about the neocortex is the chatterbox, blah, 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 blah. And the limbic system, warm, fuzzy. And the reptilian brain is the lizard. And a classic line for all teachers is you cannot talk to a lizard. They just don't respond. It's so cute. One of my little kids up north, because you teach them trauma stuff all the time, brain stuff. And he came in off the playground, and he's like, I'm like, what happened, little buddy? Oh, man, Miss Linda, the lizard made me do it. <laughs> there you go. Lizard made me do it. And now, because I don't work with kids, and I do a lot of volunteer work with men on parole, I know, there's not a long list of people doing it. They use the same thing in the court system. I don't know, Judge, the lizard made me do it, right? <laughs> Running on my reptilian brain, sir. That's what happened. So this is my favorite brain diagram, right, from childtrauma.org. It's the best one to use for your kids, for staff, because it's so basic. Like, we try to be preventive and proactive to keep kids access to that executive state, right? Because that's what teachers are teaching to, an executive state. But when you've got fearful kids, when you've got triggered kids, they're in an emotional state, limbic state, or they're running on survival state. Right? Reptilian brain. And I'll PDF this for people. I'll send it to you. I should have said that at the beginning before people had to take <laughs> copious notes. I'm just messing with you a little bit. <clears throat> okay. But doesn't that make sense for some of your kids? How do you get them to a place where they know that they're safe? Like, what does that feel like? Because it's not going to be this. Because you can say, wow, I don't get it. Like, it wasn't a big thing that happened, and he went off. It's because it tapped into this. And he's running on his brain stem, and watch out. Right? And then we back up. We give him space. He can't hear you. Right? Just like you, you can't hear people when you're totally terrified either. So does that help a little bit? And you educate kids, youth, adults about this simple, basic response, and it changes everything. 
And a lot of kids that I used to work with are like, well, for Pete's sake, someone should have told me this. I thought I was a bad kid. I thought I was a bad kid from a messed up family, from a messed up community. It's like, oh my gosh, this is what was going on. Now I got something to work on. Now I can take it back. So when we talk interventions, and I know you have lovely little books out there. Oh, it was so cute. I was looking at, well, good on you people that have all that stuff. But we talk about bottom up, because if they're running on a reptilian brain response, you got to work at a body-based level, right? And for teachers, it's just going to be the environment of your classroom, right? How calm you can stay in the face of great affect, right? Because that's what we work on all the time. And this thing where you try to do the cognitive piece with someone who's running here, we got to stop doing that because it doesn't work, right? And, and it's so amazing. If I could design schools, I would have a down regulation room on one end and an up regulation room on the other end for your dissociative kids and a counselor in each wing that's specialized in that area. And you'd have it. Because this is what we know from up north. We have had ACEs kids of the most extreme presentation and we got lucky with a lot of creative whatever with the district and we put aids on them and we've had aids on kids for four to eight years to bring them up, ACEs kids to be at the place where other kids are and then they can do it. But that costs money, right? So teachers need help, like big time. And look at this piece that comes out, which Jody's going to get so excited about. <laughs> right? Yeah, she is. Because it taps into FASD. Without FASD, ACEs, kids, like the PET scans and the MRIs, the reason we know what we know about a brain response to trauma is the bravest research participants in the world are ACEs survivors as adults who agree to have an MRI or a PET scan done of their brain while a script of their abuse is being read to them. And they map the brain. So they weren't looking for this and they found, oh my gosh, a lot of the adult survivors, way more activity on the right. I feel, I feel, I sense. There's intuition and way less on the left without FASD. So throw FASD into this, and this is a whole different extreme game that we're in. We got to approach it way different. So that idea, and this is a terrible diagram, but I, I was trying to find, like at the right, that idea, what reaches them, like visual, art base, music, what gets cut in schools? Music, art, right? And look at what you're trying to reach on the left, and it's really hard for just a straight up ACEs kids to make the shift until they feel absolutely safe. Until they feel safe. And so the relational component is going to be huge out of this. And I know it's so hard for teachers because my heroes are the little kindergarten teachers teaching in our inner, inner city schools in Prince George. And my one who I love her to death, there's nothing left to her after all these years. She's just a little tiny thing. And when she gets her kids in, half, probably half those kids. So out of 30 kids, 15 are aces and probably aces uh, a, ma a majority of those ACEs and FASD. And I'll say, how long does it take you in general to get them to a place where they feel safe and they can hear you? Six months. Six months every year. And then she's got four months to deliver curriculum. But they can't hear her until then, right? So this idea, and, and we're working on nervous system resiliency. Isn't that cool? 
is like trying to get kids to tolerate a little bit of unknown, a little bit of stress before they immediately resort to primitive coping. And what's their classic primitive coping? Shutting down, dissociating, hitting, throwing things, running. That's how you stay okay. Don't you love your little runners? Aww. I know, liability flashes in front of all school districts. We have a runner. <laughs> He's gone, right? And in Prince George, we're so lucky because the inner city schools, some of them are very close to what? Like, you're not supposed to call it the hood, but it is the hood. People that live in the hood are like, why don't you just call it the hood? Because that's where it is. And, and the people in the hood, like all ACEs survivors, almost all the majority are, and when they get little runners out of those elementary schools, the poor little TAs and the poor little child and youth care workers are out there looking for them, and people come out of their houses and they just point. <laughs> so dear. Community involvement at any level, right? That's where it goes. And it's complex. Either you've got kids, because your ACEs kids may become the bullies, or they will be re-victimized over and over and over, because you take back control where you can. And if you can't take it back with adults, take it back with other kids. So that idea is so complex. So how do you in your classroom work with your ACEs kid who's now hyper aroused in the bully and protect your dissociative kids? And that's why teachers need more support because that's a huge task, right? And there's your trauma response, either hyper aroused, like high startle, angry, 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 or at the other end, shut down, like totally shut down and anywhere in between. And where do the resources go? Yeah, hyper aroused, because we have so limited resources, right? Hyper aroused, because they're gonna do damage, property damage, chances are, right? And maybe physical damage. But your dissociative kids get dropped all the time, because we don't have the resources. So it's a fear structure. After a while, these kids, a stress reaction is encoded in their brain. And the problem becomes now, all those sensory cues that are coming at them, the brain takes it as, you're under threat, fight for your life, or run. And it can't determine, well, yeah, that's a real threat, but this is just a little perceived threat. The brain can't do that just yet. And we have this crazy thing where we're like, especially at a high school level, I'm not picking on high school at all, but it makes it really hard for, high school depends on elementary to help get these kids okay. Because once we hit high school, this becomes so difficult. Multiple teachers, multiple classrooms, like really difficult. But a lot of high school teachers will say, I don't believe that young man can't self-regulate. OK. When, chances are, when you, if you had kids, when your kids are babies, you actually down-regulate them, not just model it. When they cry, people respond, right? And when, like, you see, are they hungry? Are they cold? Are they too hot? Like, what do they need? Someone responds. If they're shut down, right, and flat, you make them laugh. You upregulate them. For a lot of kids you support in classrooms all over BC, this never happened on a consistent basis. So already, they're just back here a bit. At this point in time, they're just back here a bit. So they need time to catch up. So this beautiful idea of auto-regulation, if nobody responds, that little one will continue to auto-regulate. And sometimes you do it throughout your life. You just want to lower distress. If no one responds, then 
you know, no one responded to your crying, so you suck your thumb when you're little, you bang your head, you rock, you see a lot of rocking. When you're older, you can't suck your thumb, what do you do? You smoke. It's an amazing way to regulate, right? So the thing that we're trying to do and talk to Quinnell, Quinnell is doing amazing work in this area because they understand co-regulation. So these kids cannot go from auto-regulation to self-regulation. You've got to have a co. So the schools need more support to hire more co-regulators. And for FASD, it becomes even more important, right? Someone who responds to, and you're proactive, preventative, one step ahead all the time. What do they need to be okay? What do they need to be okay? And then they eventually will get to self-regulation, but without a co, we're not getting there. And they will auto-regulate. And if you're someone who's ever been diagnosed with OCD, sometimes that's a little bit of auto-regulation that goes on for a long time, repetitive stuff. And you just want to be okay. 